The rise of China in Asia has sparked concerns war between the new superpower and the US is inevitable. We spoke to Professor Paul Dibb from ANU College of Asia and the Pacific to gauge his views on the likelihood of the two countries being drawn into a full-scale conflict. It is very unlikely. And whilst I acknowledge that historically when a, a major new revolutionary ambitious party has come to power, like the former Hitler's Germany or Imperial Japan, war has occurred, there are now two distinct restraints that differ from those periods. first one is nuclear deterrence. Everybody knows that if major powers go to war and nuclear weapons are used, it's the end game. It's the end of those countries as modern functioning societies. It's a great inhibition. The second one is economic interdependence. I know that was an argument at the turn of the last century, before 1914, but now, as we all know, it's on a scale of interdependence that we've never seen before. You know, take the iPhone. Where is it invented? The United States, of course, where else? Where are bits made for it? In Japan. Where is it assembled? China, as long as it has low-cost labour, but it isn't going to continue having low-cost labour to be undertaken by India and Vietnam. So, I don't discount the possibility of a miscalculation over something like the Senkaku Islands or somewhere in the South China Sea, but war between the major powers, for instance China and the United States, is very unlikely, in my view. In the unlikely event of war breaking out between China and the US, Professor Dibb concedes Australia would be placed in a very difficult position. We've been in every war the Americans have been in and since the beginning of the last century, First World War. Second World War, Korean War, Vietnam War, First Gulf War, Iraq, Afghanistan. We are the ally who can't say no. But in the event, for instance, such a war, as unthinkable as I think it is, started over Taiwan and American troops were being killed by Chinese, then the Americans would invoke the ANZUS Treaty. The ANZUS Treaty says words to the effect. In the event of an attack on either parties, that is America and Australia's, troops or citizens in the Pacific area, we shall immediately consult. It doesn't say, as the NATO treaty did, an attack on one is an attack on all. And Taiwan in particular would be a very embarrassing and difficult choice, in my view. In the end, we'd probably, and reluctantly, have to say yes. But it's the sort of question you've asked me that successive foreign ministers like Gareth Evans and um, Alexander Downer have said that is a, theory, a theoretical question we prefer not to answer. A new report by China's parliament accuses the United States of human rights violations through failing to prevent its own citizens from gun violence. I think the Chinese, and one has some sympathy with this, the Chinese get a bit fed up, I think, with American um, proselytising that only we in the West are good human rights people and the Chinese are bad. So I think it's part of that tip for tat. The bottom line, however, remains that um, as much as our American friends do naughty things, China is still a repressive authoritarian regime that has, what do they call them? Education through labour camps. And where some of this stuff, not iPhones, but some of the silly little toys you get for your dogs and the cats and so on, and other cheap products, are probably made by slave labour in these corrective labour camps. How many are there in these camps in China? We don't know, unlike the former Soviet Union, where we did know, thanks to Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, the estimate I've seen for China is maybe 200,000 people. So, you know... You know, those in uh, glass houses shouldn't throw stones.